Hello, everybody, and welcome to Module 1 of our Basic Financial Accounting course. In this video, we're going to be talking about the introduction to certain accounting principles and concepts. So one of the first questions we want to ask and answer is, what is accounting? Now, obviously, you've, you've heard the term accounting, you've heard the term account in a variety of different ways in your personal life. We're talking about it from a business perspective, mainly, and we tend to talk about for-profit corporations a lot with the accounting. We're going to define this in three different sections. Accounting is really the process of identifying information that is important for users, figuring out how to measure it and actually measuring it, which is a lot of times referred to as the bookkeeping aspect and then communicating it, which in this case we're talking about the financial statements mainly. So when we talk about this, we're taking all this information, figuring out what is important to track, figuring out how we're going to track it, doing the journal entries, the posting, all of that that we'll talk about throughout this course, and then we're communicating it generally in the form of a financial statement to users. So that leads us to the next question. Who are these users? Who is this information being communicated to? There we're going to break it down to two different groups, two main groups. We have external users, which are the investors, the stockholders, the creditors, the government, anybody that needs to know information about the company but does not have direct access to it. And then we're going to talk about the internal users, which would be management generally management or the accounting staff people that have direct access to the inside information within the company now in this course in this 15 module course we're going to be talking about both financial accounting as well as managerial accounting for the first approximately two-thirds of the course we're going to be talking about the external users for with financial accounting and then the last third we'll talk about the managerial accounting and the internal users so now we talked just briefly about that manager managerial versus financial accounting. So what is the difference? We're going to see some of those differences. We're going to talk about them. And we also have another aspect of accounting I wanted to bring up, which was cost accounting. Cost accounting tends to be kind of a, a connector between the two, managerial and financial accounting. I would say it falls more on the managerial side. But with managerial or with cost accounting, we're talking about the cost of providing a service or developing and selling a product. Now, again, that's mainly for the managerial side, but it also becomes important for the financial side because when we look at the income statement and the balance sheet, those are two of our financial statements, we're going to see that inventory, the cost of that inventory when we build it and then eventually when we sell it, that shows up on both of those financial statements that inventory cost is developed using cost accounting so no I know here I'm jumping ahead a little bit but I just wanted to point out that cost accounting is a another type of accounting that falls under both of these so managerial versus financial that's what we're going to mainly focus on so let's take a look at some of the differences and similarities between the two first of all who uses the information with financial accounting, again, the users tend to be external users mainly. The stockholders, the owners, the uh, creditors, the bank who's lending money to the company, the bondholders that are buying bonds of this company, they tend to use this information, the four financial statements that we'll see later on. They use this to make decisions about how well the company is operating and whether it continues to be a good investment or a safe investment. Now, managerial accounting is used by internal users to make decisions about how best to run the company. Again, they need to understand the cost of a particular product or service so they can develop a price for that product or service. They need to know which department's doing well, which one's having trouble. So what we're going to see is they need to get a little bit more detailed information than you would ever see with financial statements. What types of reports? So I've alluded to the fact that financial accounting tends to focus on four core financial statements that we're going to see a little bit later on. These are the balance sheet, the income statement, the statement of stockholders' equity, 
and the cash flow statement. Now, I don't expect you to memorize that right now. We'll see that later on. But these are very similar types of reports from one company to the next as far as the design. They're pretty standardized. And they're pretty high level. That's the other thing about this. With financial accounting, you don't see a lot of great detail. But with managerial accounting, you do see that detail because, again, management needs those details to make decisions about how to run the company. The other thing with managerial accounting reports is that they're not nearly as standard as financial statements. Every company might have a different group of reports they like to run. Uh, there are some standard systems out there, off-the-shelf systems, and they can customize them a little bit. But basically, it's up to what management wants to see about that company. Now, the types of standards. We're going to spend a good chunk of time in financial accounting talking about various standards that apply. Now, we're not going to look at specific numbers, specific financial accounting standard numbers or anything like that. We're just going to talk about some basic concepts. So the important thing to get out of that is that financial accounting does indeed have those types of standards, whereas managerial accounting, for the most part, does not. And the reason for this is that with financial accounting, there's a concern that the company might be trying to mislead investors or other external users by measuring things in certain ways that are not the same as what they did last year. They're not the same as what most people do. Because of this, certain standards are mandated. But with managerial accounting, the information is for management to use. So it would be them misleading themselves, which doesn't make any sense. There's not, there's not a concern with them doing that. There's no incentive for them to do that. So for that reason, for the most part, there are no standards applied against managerial accounting. Now, I say for the most part, there are certain exceptions. And I actually work in one of those areas where there's an exception. I work with Medicare auditing. And the government reimburses hospitals based on their cost report. And for this reason, the underlying cost, which is largely based on managerial accounting information within the hospital, that is, they, they're required to follow certain standards when they develop that information. There are cost accounting standards. There are Medicare policies and regulations that must be followed. So that's a little bit of an exception. There are some other exceptions out there, but for the most part, the broad industry is not regulated as the same way as financial accounting is. Again, we'll see more about that later on. The time periods. This is another difference that's important. With financial accounting, you're, you're definitely going to have an annual report. It's required, especially if you're a publicly traded company. If you're also that publicly traded company, you'll have a quarterly report as well. That's a requirement. Uh, some companies might want to have man uh, monthly reports. They generally wouldn't publish them, but they keep them. Even though it's an external report, they also use that internally as well. So they might have those. But for managerial accounting, it's all across the board. You're Again, every company is going to have annual reports. They're probably going to have quarterly they almost definitely will have monthly for managerial accounting reports, but they might even go to weekly, daily, and in some cases even hourly. If you've ever worked at a restaurant, that's the best example I have. I've, when I worked at a restaurant uh, throughout high school and even a little bit into college, uh, we ran what were known as labor reports, and we did it hourly and sometimes even more frequently to determine how the labor cost of keeping people on the clock, how that compared with the sales that were coming in. If we had more people than what we expected for the sales that we were having, in other words, if it was not as busy as we expected, then we'd ask people if they'd like to leave early and sometimes say, hey, you're instead of working till 8, you're going to work till 7 now to keep the labor cost down. So those are the types of reports you might see on an hourly basis. Now, as far as careers and accounting, this is just a, a brief list of different types of careers or really certifications that you might see in accounting. You know, when I first entered into the accounting field, 
I thought, hey, an account. I thought every accountant was basically the same. I didn't quite realize how broad the field was. But as you dig in further, you realize it's much, much, much broader. It's a very broad field. Financial accounting is the, the basic level. And for that, you get a certification. One of the many certifications would, and the most prominent would be the Certified Public Accountant, CPA. Again, financial accounting, managerial accounting. You have the CMA, Certified Managerial Accountant. Now, you could also go into external auditing, and this would be uh, auditing and accounting are very closely related. Auditing is more like reviewing the accountant's work. So you have external auditing, which is known as public accounting. The CPA also applies for that. And you have internal auditing. So this is an auditor that works within the company to help them find weaknesses and correct them. And that would be a certified internal auditor, CIA. So nice little acronym there. Uh, taxation. That's probably the first area of accounting anybody deals with. You hear about the taxes. As soon as you start working, you're getting taxed. A CPA often deals with that as well. There are some tax certifications out there also. And then government not-for-profit accounting. Now, this one is a rather unusual field. I, I've actually taught this class, class in the past, and it's just unusual. There are a lot of things that you learn in financial accounting. Some of them carry over to the government not-for-profit accounting side, but there are a lot of extra things you have to learn in government not-for-profit accounting. And so that's a separate field altogether. Education, that's a, certainly a field I'm involved with. Education, teaching people about accounting, whether it be uh, people that want to go into accounting or just people that are running companies that need to learn about the accounting side of things. There's also one that's a growing field lately, fraud and forensic accounting. So it's like taking auditing to a much higher level. Here, you're going in with a fraud and forensic accounting, and you're, you're basically, you're there for a reason. There's a belief that fraud is occurring. So now you're trying to dig in to uncover proof or evidence of that. So, you know, a lot of people liked CSI, uh, crime scene investigations, and those types of shows. This is similar to that, only from the accounting side, so it can get exciting. People tend to like that. Now let's dig a little bit into the history of accounting. Now this just sets the stage for things. This doesn't necessarily carry through to the rest of the course, but it's still kind of important to understand. And it's surprising. When I first learned this in my first accounting course, I was really surprised. I figured, hey, accounting has been around for maybe a few decades. That's kind of what I was thinking, maybe you know, 50 years or so. In reality, accounting evidence has been found in civilizations back 7,000 years. Now, obviously, accounting 7,000 years ago was much, much, much different than what we see now. But the idea is they were tracking certain types of transactions in much different ways, but tracking nonetheless. Double entry bookkeeping, which is the system that we use for financial accounting, the system we're going to talk much more about throughout the rest of this course, this has actually been around since 1494, which in itself is surprising. And what I'll say about that is that a lot of the terms we're going to use, debits and credits, the T account, the ledger, all of that, the basic model is still the same thing that we use today. Obviously, everything, a lot of things are computerized now, and there are a lot of account names that would have never existed before, but the underlying models that we're going to look at have existed since 1494. Uh, the first standards. We talked about standardization, rules and everything that apply to financial accounting. These have been in place. The first real standards have been in place since about 1932, a lot of things were going on around that time. You had the, the stock market crash, the big thing, big impetus for these changes. Eventually, that led to the Securities Exchange Commission, the SEC that's still around today. And they, they ultimately have the power to set standards. They're a government agency, of course. They ultimately have that power. However, virtually since the beginning, 
they've delegated that power down to an kind of an independent board. Uh, the one today that's in play, it's been around since the 70s, is the Financial Accounting Standards Board, the FASB. There were a variety of other boards prior to that, but the big one that we need to know about now is the FASB. And the FASB essentially sets GAAP, G-A-A-P, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. That's a very important term to understand. Now, basically what it means is the rules of accounting. When you hear somebody say the gap requires this or gap requires this, that's it's basically just saying the accounting rules. So generally accepted accounting principles. Again, we're not going to learn any specific numbers of these statements in this basic course, but you need to know what gap refers to in general. Now here is a website, which I would advise you to take a look at it. It's fasb.org. And it's the Financial Accounting Standards Board page. Just browse around there and see what information you can find. It might be some interesting things you can search. You can just browse to certain places, things like that. We'll go through that in another video. Now, the FASB is a United States board. Again, it's been around since the 70s. There's another board that's been around since around the same time. It's international. It's the International Accounting Standards Board, the IASB. Uh, the website is actually ifrs.org, International Financial Reporting Standards.org. That's what that basically means. So whereas the U.S. sets GAAP, the U.S. FASB sets GAAP, the IASB sets IFRS, IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. Now, uh, the important thing about the International Standards Board is that a lot of other companies like Many, many, most of the other countries have adopted international accounting standards or at least allow them to be used. Currently, the United States does not allow companies to use international standards. We have to use GAAP. At some point, it would be nice if that changes, but right now it's all U.S. GAAP. So that's an important thing to note. The two boards have, at least for a while, for quite a while, we're working together to try to get closer and closer to the same set of standards. That's been kind of off the table for the past uh, almost a decade now. Hopefully that'll uh, change and they'll start working on that again. The next board that I'll bring up is the Auditing Standards Board, the ASB. Now this, again, this is auditing. It's basically the review of accounting standards. We'll, we'll define it a little bit more deeply later. But this group, they set standards for how auditors should be reviewing accounting information to make sure that the companies are following the proper rules. Now, this particular board is an arm of the AICPA, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. So we have that. Now, the interesting thing about that is that this essentially means that the professional organization for accountants and auditors also sets their own standards for the auditors. That was a bit of a concern because it's essentially a self-regulated industry. And there were a lot of things that happened in right around the 2000s, early 2000s. There were a lot of scandals that happened around that same time. Uh, accounting fraud by very big companies, Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, just a, a string of companies, a very big string of companies that had essentially fraudulent financial statements. And because of this, there were a lot of concerns that maybe the auditing companies, auditing firms weren't really doing what they were supposed to do. They didn't find these situations coming up. So there are a lot of things that happened that led to the passage of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. Uh, you may have heard of this referred to as SOX. It's a congressional piece of legislation that did a lot. We're going to talk about that in another video. But essentially, they set requirements for companies to have strong internal control systems. They set a lot of requirements for auditors and how they would audit companies. The fact that a company could not have the same CPA firm audit them and provide certain types of services to them. Uh, there were some rules changed where CEOs and CFOs of companies 
could no longer get away with saying, hey, I didn't know that was going on in my company. Now they have to certify to the accuracy of financial statements, and they're putting themselves at civil and criminal liability if fraud occurs. Even if they didn't directly get involved with it, they're still, uh, they're still liable for those issues. So now we're going to start digging into some certain concepts and principles. Now, one thing I want to mention here is that certain texts, certain textbooks, certain courses get overly concerned about whether a particular item is a principle versus a concept versus an assumption versus a constraint. There are some differences between those four terms, but there's also a lot of similarity between them. What I'm going to say right now is don't be concerned with this particular label. Instead, be concerned with the underlying phrase. I'm going to say this is not a big deal because I've actually seen multiple instances where some of these terms are called a principle in one text, but they're called a concept in another text. So if you understand the basic gist of that term, you'll be fine. So that's what we're going to go through. The first one we're going to talk about is the accounting entity. Now, again, you can call that the accounting entity principle, the accounting entity concept, whatever you want to use. I'm just going to call it the accounting entity. And the idea here is that we want to make sure that what we're seeing in these financial statements is from the company's perspective. We're not looking so much at the owner. We don't care about the owner's vehicle, the owner's bank account, the owner's house, any of that. We care about what resources the company has, what debts the company has, and then how much has been invested into the company by its owners. So that last piece is a little bit of a crossover, but the key thing is that it has to be related directly to the company. We have uh, consistency or comparability, and the idea here is essentially that if a company is using one set of standards to measure certain things like depreciation, inventory, a lot of things we'll talk about later, if they use one method, and accounting you know, gap a lot of times allows for two, three, or four methods to be used, they can choose between which method they use, consistency and comparability is basically saying, make sure you use the same method year after year. Don't keep changing methods. That doesn't mean they can never change, but they have to have a very good reason to do so. And there are actually some additional costs, uh, time-wise, reporting-wise, if they decide to change. We'll talk more about that in later videos as well. The going concern concept, and again, I threw that word in there. I should have left that off. Going concern, sometimes it's called an assumption, is that and this one's actually better as an assumption because it, we really are assuming, we're required to assume that absent very clear evidence to the contrary, we assume that this company will continue on for the foreseeable future. Now, the reason this assumption is important is that a lot of transactions we're going to talk about are longer term type transactions. They last over multiple years. For example, if they bought a building and it's going to last 20 years, they're supposed to spread that cost out over 20 years. And that works very well if you can assume that the company will be around for around 20 years or more. If you know for sure this company is going to be gone within a year or two, then spreading cost out over 20 years no longer makes any sense. So that's the going concern assumption. We we assume it's going to be around for a while. We'll you know we'll get into some examples where that might not happen. This comes up more in auditing as well because the auditors have to look at that and see if they have any reason to believe they won't be around. Conservatism in accounting. This basically means that we don't want to be overly optimistic when conveying information accounting information specifically. So we don't want to give good news unless we know for sure that good news is legitimate. On the other hand, we want to give the bad news anytime it looks like that may happen. So it sounds pessimistic and it kind of is, but the idea here is that you want to make you want to be very transparent 
and make sure your investors realize what kind of the worst case scenario is. Here's what very well could happen. That way they're prepared for it. If they're not willing to take the risk, they can sell and move on to another company. You'd rather give them news, assuming you don't know for sure what's going to happen. You'd rather give them news that's kind of understated. In other words, hey, we think this bad case is going to happen, bad situation is going to happen, and then have it end up being a little bit better. You'd prefer that as opposed to giving them this great news that, hey, we think we're going to do very great this next year, and then all of a sudden have it fall flat. In that case, the investors are likely to think the company intentionally lied to them. So that's conservatism. Materiality, this comes as a shock to many the first time in accounting, but the idea here is that accounting is not about perfection. We're not looking to get things down to the penny, even though that, like I said, comes as a shock. We're, the reason we're not looking to do this is that to try to do so, to try to get perfection, would require a lot of extra time and a lot of extra effort, and it probably would not be worth it to anybody using the accounting statements. The idea of materiality is that if a small error, potential error, wouldn't change anybody's mind about the company anyways, then we're not so concerned about getting a perfect number up to that amount. Now, again, at some point, if you're a million dollars off on a particular amount, virtually any company that's going to be material for, that definitely would change somebody else's mind. But if you're off by $10, you know, that's probably for any company that's not really going to matter too much. $100, it probably still won't matter. 1000 it depends on the company. A really small company, $1,000 might be a big deal. Uh, for a large company, a multinational company, $1,000 is a drop in the bucket. So if you're if you have a mistake of that amount, it's probably not that big of a deal. The idea here is that you want to analyze the costs of getting that extra perfection versus the benefits the, that the added accuracy of the information will have for the users. Full disclosure, the idea here is that the company should be very transparent, should disclose all financial information about the company. And again, this doesn't mean they're going to share their company secrets or anything like that, but they should be clear and transparent about that, give all relevant information to the investors. Objectivity, the idea here is that whenever possible, things should be fact-based. They should not be an opinion. There are certain exceptions where opinions and estimates are all the company has to go off of, but facts are much better. The monetary unit or unit of measurement, that basically says that in accounting on financial statements and such, we're concerned with measuring things in a dollar, a euro, a yen, whatever form of currency you're using, that's what we're wanting to do. We're not going to record things in pounds of materials or hours of something or even units of product. It's all money-based, monetary-based. When we get to managerial accounting, certainly they do track things non-monetarily, but for financial accounting, it's all monetary. The historical cost principle, this is basically where we record assets at their original cost. We do not update them to a newer value. Uh, we don't say, hey, well, I could buy this asset now for a higher price or I could sell it now for a higher price. So the historical cost principle just says assets are reported at cost. There are some downward exceptions to this, but we never update it to a higher fair value. International standards do allow for a fair value. U.S. GAAP, for the most part, does not. There are some exceptions when we're talking about investments, stocks and bonds and things, but we'll stick with the historical cost principle for now. The time period principle, or periodicity, this basically says we break the company, we break the life of the company into periods. Uh, months, quarters, years, whatever the case may be, rather than just keeping records for a, a never-ending, well, I shouldn't say never-ending, an ongoing life of the company, 
we want to have periods so we can actually report on them and compare one month to the next or one year to the next. That's what we're saying here. The accrual concept, the accrual accounting, that's what U.S. GAAP requires, versus the cash basis of accounting. The difference, for example, with the cash basis is that revenues are recorded based on when the revenue is received, when the cash is received for that revenue. No matter when we actually sell the product or provide the service, it's when we collect the cash that we record the revenue. For the expense, it's all about when did we pay for that. The accrual concept, on the other hand, says we aren't so concerned about when the cash changes hands. We're concerned about the underlying transaction. When did we really earn the revenue? For example, when did we sell the product? When did we provide the service? Or when did we really use up that benefit that's leading to that expense, regardless of when we paid for it? We will have a separate video on accrual-based accounting. That's a very important concept. And that actually leads to the last two of these concepts or principles that we'll talk about. Revenue recognition, which is all about when do we record revenues. And again, under accrual-based accounting, we record them when we've earned it, regardless of when we received it. The matching principle is another word for the expense recognition principle. And that basically tells us when do we need to record expenses. In many cases, we try to record the expense when we recorded the re revenue that it related to. Uh, the best example of this would be the expense or cost of inventory that we've just sold. You know, if we bought the inventory and now we're selling it at a higher price, that underlying cost gets recorded as an expense when we sell the inventory, not when we first bought it ourselves. That matches that cost up with the actual revenue from selling the inventory. So there are other examples of that, and again, we'll see those concepts in deep uh, later on.